Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Brian. Nice to see all of you here, and I recognize many of you, which is uh, comforting. So, um, one thing, I'm going to mostly read what I wanted to say, although I'll try to read it in an engaging voice so I don't lose my place, and I've also uh, got some slides to illustrate what I'm talking about. But uh, today, I'll be talking about everybody's uh, favorite and least controversial topic in medical ethics, which is the ethics of infant male circumcision. And um, people typically come to this topic with very, very different background stores of information. So some people know a great deal about circumcision, including the history and some of the medical information. Other people know next to nothing, or they have some vague ideas. And people's opinions also vary. Some people have very strong opinions one way or the other, and that doesn't always line up to how much they know about the topic. Other people don't seem to care. So what I want to do is, before I get into a bunch of specific arguments, is take quite a bit of time to lay out some of this background information so that we can be on a shared uh, page when it comes to discussing the details a little bit later on. Um, as you already know from the abstract, my perspective is going to be largely uh, critical or skeptical about circumcision today. Uh, except for two conditions, and that's either when it's uh, being offered as the most conservative possible treatment for an actually presenting disease or pathology, rather than a hypothetical future disease or pathology, uh, or when it's undertaken voluntarily for whatever reason, so long as the person uh, going through the procedure has been informed about the risks and uh, uh, is um, able to give meaningful consent. So, as a preview, just because I want to take time to given a context for this, uh, this is the basic premise that I'll be working from uh, for the ethical discussion later. Uh, it should be considered morally impermissible to remove healthy, functional, erogenous tissue from another person's body without first asking for and then actually receiving that person's informed permission. Now, I'll just say that the word erogenous is probably not necessary for this argument, but I've included it just to remind you what it is that we're talking about. And uh, the word functional is probably not strictly necessary either, because if you were to uh, cut off someone's earlobe or remove some nice gentleman's nipple without his permission or something like this, that would also be impermissible. Um, but I'll go ahead and stick with this formulation I've given for the time being just to see where it leads us. Now, um, if this sort of action, by which I mean removing this tissue without permission, were done under any other pretext than circumcising a male child, and I do mean specifically a male, uh, specifically when he's a child, and specifically when the tissue being removed is from his genitals, uh, it would be uncontroversially regarded, at least in any modern secular state, as being a form of criminal assault. And the consequences would, would ordinarily be rather severe. Um, so the Australian pediatrician Christopher Green has put it this way. If I was to cut off any other part of a baby for no good cause and without an anesthetic, I'd be struck off the medical register and the parents would most likely lose custody of the child. So I'll have to explain uh, why I think this is a good premise, uh, a good starting place for discussions about non-therapeutic surgeries carried out in specifically constitutional democracies, which I'll explain that emphasis later. And then I'll consider a number of possible exceptions to this rule, hey Joe, um, including the idea that circumcision might provide health benefits, that it might reduce HIV transmission in sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, that circumcision might help someone to fulfill a perceived cultural obligation or religious requirement. And my goal in all of this, of course, is going to be sh to show that the arguments that are typically raised in support of these propositions are ultimately not very convincing, and that therefore circumcision should be delayed if it does need to happen at all until the individual himself can weigh in on whether or not he would like to have his own foreskin removed. Uh, for some context, I want to show you a chart here so that you can get an overview of uh, where circumcision is typically performed and how the practice got started in these various places. Um, the, the red color corresponds to places in the world where circumcision of infants happens on a routine or a quasi-medical basis. And it's just the United States, also Israel, um, and that's it. Um, green corresponds to places where circumcision is not carried out of any kind. These gray colored countries are where infant circumcision did happen somewhat recently, but has since been abandoned. So that's uh, in the United Kingdom, as well as Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. The purple countries correspond to teenage uh, circumcision that's done as a rite of passage. You see this in these Central African countries, as well as in the Philippines, and uh, here in South Korea, which is kind of an, anom uh, an, an anomaly, which I'll explain later on. 
And then these orange colored countries are where circumcision is done, uh, including uh, females as well. Um, in these are mostly Muslim countries or with predominantly Muslim populations. And you see uh, in Indonesia as well. So 80% uh, of the world's male population are not circumcised, but uh, you see the, the other 20% coming from these colored areas, with again the United States being the only country and certainly the only country in the developed world to uh, continue to circumcise infants for no medical reason. Um, so in the United States, which is my home country, you have circumcisions performed between 500,000 and a million times each year, and almost entirely on infants and newborns. And this custom was started in the U.S. in the 1800s, uh, primarily as a way to combat the evil of the era, which was childhood masturbation. Um, physicians at that time were operating under the nerve theory of disease, as opposed to the germ theory of disease that we have now, which suggested that too much nervous excitation of bodily tissue could cause things like blindness and epilepsy and paralysis and a range of other real and imaginary uh, diseases like hip joint disease and uh, hysteria. Um, it's probably not an accident that this theory was, well, I'll just say, so the, so the idea is if you could remove the most sensitive tissue from the genitals of both uh, boys and girls at the time, then you would be able to cure this wide range or prevent this wide range of diseases. So uh, it's not an accident that this theory was being popularized at a time when moral norms and attitudes about things like sex and masturbation were almost totally derived from the teachings of Puritan ministers and from fundamentalist readings of the Bible. So these two forces work together very effectively to establish a kind of quasi-medical, quasi-moral, quasi-cultural phenomenon, which is the same as it persists in the United States today. And I'll just mention that uh, clitoridectomies, or amputations of the clitoris, were being performed in the United States at the same time for the same reason. So what's called female genital mutilation used to be an American pastime as well, uh, although that practice eventually fell out of favor and has obviously and rightly been criminalized. Um, Here's my favorite quote about this issue from the, the Lancet uh, from April of 1860. In cases of masturbation, we must, I believe, break the habit by inducing such a condition of the parts as will cause too much local suffering for, to allow of the practice being continued. For this purpose, if the practice is long, we may uh, circumcise the male patient with present and probably with future advantage. The operation, too, should not be performed under chloroform so that the pain experience may be associated with the habit we wish to eradicate. Uh, that's from a, an article entitled On an Injurious Habit Occasionally Met With in Infancy and Early Childhood by one A. A. Johnson and its representative of articles from this time. This is actually from 20 years later. Uh, the title, you can't probably see it, says Therapeutic Effects of Lightning Upon Cancer, uh, also in the Lancet. So just to give you some context about what uh, medical theories like this time. Um, that quote was from 1860 that I shared, but the idea of using male circumcision as a way to reduce or control sexual sensation uh, came from many centuries earlier, as you'll see in this quote from the Jewish philosopher Moses Maimonides, who wrote in the 12th century. With regard to circumcision, one of the reasons for it is the wish to bring about a decrease in sexual intercourse and a weakening of the organ in question, so that this activity be diminished and the organ be in as quiet a state as possible. In fact, this commandment has not been prescribed with a view to perfecting what is defective congenitally, but to perfecting what is defective morally. The bodily pain caused to that member is the real purpose of circumcision. Procreation is not rendered impossible, but violent concupiscence and lust that goes beyond what is needed are diminished. That's from the famous Guide to the Perplexed. Um, Maimonides was also a physician, and while medicine in the 12th century was not exactly up to speed, a number of more recent studies have confirmed that circumcision does in fact weaken the organ in question in a number of ways. Um, first, it removes the most touch sensitive tissue, uh, the nerve endings from the penis which are concentrated in the foreskin. Uh, second, circumcision frequently shortens the perineal nerve which terminates the frenulum and is responsible for initiating and maintaining erections, so you sometimes see an increase in erectile problems later in life. Um, Third, it eliminates the gliding function of the foreskin, which helps reduce abrasive friction during intercourse and therefore reduces irritation of either vaginal or anal tissue, depending upon the kind of intercourse. And uh, fourth, it exposes the head of the penis to environmental irritation, which causes it to lose its ordinary softness and sensitivity and become quite a bit more thickened and dried out. And uh, this follows from the fact that the foreskin probably evolved to protect the head of the penis, uh, which is ordinarily an internal organ and it develops out of the very same tissue as the clitoral hood, which has the same protective function in females. 
and which exists in all mammal species. So uh, I'm going to show you a few pictures to illustrate what I'm talking about, and I'd like to give you the warning that these are not safe for work, but this is my work. So uh, I'll just say if you're uncomfortable seeing uh, pictures or photographs of male genitals, then you can sort of look away and uh, check back in in a few minutes. The first thing I want to show you is an image of an, uh, an infant penis. And it's a comparison between an uncircumcised penis on the left and a circumcised penis on the right about a week after surgery. Now, obviously, any surgical intervention is not going to look very nice, uh, especially while the tissue is still in the process of healing. But the thing to think about here is that this particular surgery is not actually treating anything. Uh, there's no disease or pathology in this case. So what you have is what people sometimes call a social surgery or an elective surgery, except that the person actually going through the surgery and therefore taking on the risks and the consequences, which I'll talk about later, is not at all the same person who actually did the electing or the choosing. But now this person has a wound on his penis that has to be bandaged, that is very uncomfortable and prone to infection, uh, that comes into contact with urine and feces, and that sometimes has to go in for a second corrective surgery if he develops needle stenosis, which happens in up to 20% of cases. And needle stenosis is a narrowing of the urethral opening, which happens because it's now been exposed to the environment, it's becoming irritated, coming into contact with urine and feces and so on. Uh, and uh, basically, this is what the foreskin is there to prevent from happening. I also want to say something about the terminology I use uh, when I introduce these pictures, which is that I refer to the image on the left as an uncircumcised penis and the one on the right as a circumcised penis. And uh, it might be worth thinking for a minute about what the term uncircumcised actually means, or at least implies. And what it implies is that the penis on the left is uh, the uncircumcised penis is just sort of waiting to be circumcised, or has not yet been circumcised. Um, but obviously another way you could refer to this image would be to say just that this is an image of a normal penis. Or if you were really making the point, you could say that this is an intact or a whole penis, whereas the penis on the right side is one that's had part of it cut off. So what this shows is that this particular type of male genital cutting has become such an accepted part of Western culture that we've had to invent a special derivative name that's based on the idea of cutting to refer back to the normal penis that comes as a standard issue when you're born. And part of why we do this is because the foreskin has been misconstrued as being somehow an extra part of the body or a vestigial structure like people used to say about the appendix. Uh, but the anatomists Christopher Cold and Kenneth McGrath have shown that this is very much not the case. So they wrote an essay called Anatomy and Histiology of the Penile and Clitoral Prepuce in Primates, and they write, the results of this study demonstrate that the human prepuce is not vestigial, but is in fact an evolutionary advancement over the prepuce of other primates. This is most clearly seen in the evolutionary increase in corpuscular innervation of the human prepuce and the concomitant decrease in corpuscular receptors of the human glands relative to the innervation of the prepuce and glands of lower primate. And the theory that's been offered is that um, this increased innervation developed through a process of uh, sexual selection. So that's something to think about as we go through the rest of these images. Um, the second set of images is to illustrate the point I was making about the head of the penis becoming exposed and drying out after circumcision. On one side is an intact penis with the foreskin pulled back, and you can see that the skin is a pink color. It's very soft and sensitive to the touch. And on the other side is a circumcised penis where the skin has dried out and it's become thicker and less sensitive because it's rubbing against clothing um, and other environmental factors. Um, I also talked about uh, the perineal nerve and that it terminates in the frenulum. This is the underside of the penis. So uh, on the left is a picture of an intact penis with an intact frenulum. The frenulum is also extremely sensitive to the touch. And on the other side is a circumcised penis with a missing frenulum. And you can see that the circumcision scar uh, over here on the left side of the image. Uh, finally, I talked about the gliding and lubricating function of the foreskin, which has always lost to circumcision, at least the form of circumcision that's practiced now, which I'll explain in a moment. And this last image is actually an animated image, so you can see the motion I'm referring to, and I guess if you call this a graphic image, so um, just be prepared. But uh, that's the motion that I'm referring to, and that's completely lost to circumcision. This is on a loop, so I'll uh, <laughs> click off. Now, I said that uh, this function is always lost to circumcision, but actually that isn't the full story, at least within Judaism, because uh, Jews used to practice a much milder form of circ circumcision from the time of Abraham to about 100 or 150 AD. And the Jewish-American scholar Leonard Glick has written a book about this, published by the Oxford University Press, 
in which he argues that the original Jewish covenant involved a kind of token excision of just the very tip of the foreskin, leaving most of its protective and lubricating functions that I was describing intact. Uh, but the problem came in the Hellenistic period, when Jewish athletes would try to stretch out the remaining tissue that they had to uh, look more like their Greek counterparts. Uh, and this raised the threat of assimilation, which the rabbis at that time were not very happy about, and probably not happy about at any time. And so they mandated that circumcision be changed from this relatively mild version to what we have today, which is the complete re removal of about a third or a half of the skin system of the penis, because there's no way to uh, assimilate that way. Now, I want to make one more point about all these images, which is a point I'm borrowing from the biophysicist Ryan McAllister from Georgetown, uh, who also does research on this topic. And he points out that uh, people sometimes talk about the risks or the complications or the harms associated with circumcision. And what they're trying to refer to in those situations is when something gets cut off that wasn't intended to be cut off. So this is when part of the head of the penis is severed, or when not enough skin is left on to accommodate an erection when the child grows up, or something like this. Um, but his point is that male genital cutting, again, has become such an accepted part of Western culture that doing things like completely eliminating the actual protective and sexual functions of the foreskin or removing erogenous tissue that the baby was born with and might at least want to try out at some point is not actually thought of as being a harm or a complication. That's just construed as being part of the surgery. Uh, now, I want to go back to this quote from The Lancet that I showed you earlier, which was the one that said uh, down here, the operation should not be performed under chloroform. Now, you might think that since 1860, we've figured out that babies and small children should be given adequate pain control if they're made to go through a surgery on a very sensitive part of the body. But unfortunately, this is not typically the case. In the traditional Jewish ceremony, just for a point of reference, the baby gets a little bit of wine that's been spilled onto a cloth and is allowed to suck on this, and that's the pain control. Um, but in a hospital setting, um, the situation isn't much better. Um, uh, the procedure is frequently done either with no anesthesia or also topical cream like what you might get at the dentist, and neither of these is anywhere close to sufficient given what's actually being done. Uh, the latest numbers that I could find are from a 2004 survey of doctors in the U.S., and just 25% of obstetricians reported using any form of anesthesia during circumcision. And obstetricians in the U.S. are the ones who do this procedure rather than pediatricians because of an interesting historical turf war that we can talk about. So uh, circumcision is extremely painful for infants, in part because the foreskin is actually fused to the head of the penis at birth, very much in the way that your fingernail is fused to your finger. And that means that this membrane has to be forcibly separated in order to complete the surgery. And you can probably imagine how that feels to the infant. Uh, the situation is considerably different for adults, by the way, and I'll take a moment to explain these differences because they'll be relevant to my argument later on about the advantages of delaying circumcision until an age of consent. So, just so you don't have to look at that picture anymore, I'll show you a picture of an adult, a generic adult. Um, so the first thing that's different is that the foreskin separates naturally from the head of the penis by about puberty. So no tearing is required to get it to come off at this later age. Uh, second, the penis has reached its full size, so that it's a lot harder to make a mistake about how much skin is removed. Third, you can remove exactly as much or as little of the foreskin as the adult would like or feel comfortable with. Uh, and finally, uh, the adult would insist on general anesthesia, which is too risky for infants, and so it's not used. And then uh, they would make sure that adequate pain control is given after as well. On the other side of things, uh, infants' nervous systems are still developing when they come out of the womb, and we don't yet know all the downstream effects of early trauma on the course of this development. We do know that infants sometimes go into shock from the surgery. We know that their heart rate and cortisol levels go through the roof. We know that circumcision can interfere with breastfeeding patterns. It can interrupt maternal infant bonding. It makes infants more irritable and less consolable than when they're left alone. And it can alter the infant's long-term sensitivity to pain. So a number of researchers have summarized these types of effects as constituting an infant analog to post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, the one thing circumcision does not do, of course, is actually eliminate the urge to masturbate. So um, you kind of wonder how this idea uh, for treatment ever caught on. OK, that's America. Uh, the Americans got the idea from the British, who were doing the same thing at the same time for the same reasons, namely to combat masturbation. Uh, this was the Victorian period here in England, so maybe that's not a surprise. But uh, the British gave up the practice by about 1960, and this is because it had become clear to the medical establishment that the health benefits that were usually being cited for circumcision were largely spurious, that they didn't apply to infants in any case, since they mostly had to do with sexually transmitted infections, which babies are not prone to getting, 
and that any health benefits that could be gained could be gained more easily, more effectively, more ethically, less riskily, and less invasively by other means, including basic hygiene. So circumcision rates have dropped from a high of about 30% to less than 4% here in England. The same story goes for Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, where circumcision has also been effectively abandoned. And of course, in mainland Europe, circumcision was never a part of the culture in the first place, and it never caught on uh, as a medical fashion. So I mentioned that South Koreans do circumcise um, the island of purple over here in the green. Um, but they didn't do this until the 1950s, when they picked up the habit from, from the Americans, specifically through uh, the military after World War II. And they modified the custom to apply to teenagers and adults rather than to infants. And this is worth talking about for a second because Koreans are actually disturbed by the American version of circumcision, since they think that infants are too young and too weak to have their genitals operated on as a regular event, whereas they think that teenagers can at least prepare themselves for the surgery and make whatever sense out of it as a conscious decision. Uh, teenage circumcision is also quite common in the African countries I mentioned, where it's done as a rite of passage into manhood, and in this regard, it's similar to how female genital cutting is seen in some of these countries as being a part of becoming a woman. Uh, although both of these forms of circumcision have exceptionally high rates of mortality, as I'll discuss in a little bit. Uh, finally, male circumcision is nearly universal in the Middle East because of Islam, although many people are not aware that circumcision is not uh, thought by all Muslims to be a requirement. In fact, uh, the Quran does not mention circumcision at all. And so instead it has more to do with the impression uh, or rather the misimpression that circumcision is somehow cleaner, as well as with ideas about being initiated into the wider Muslim community. And I'll talk more about Muslim circumcision uh, later on in a bit more detail. Circumcision is also very popular in Israel for obvious reasons, although Israel is also home to one of the largest and most vocal anti-circumcision movements, with the other one being in the United States, as well as a handful of groups around the world, including here in the UK. So um, here you have a large number of Jewish anti-circumcision advocates who are pushing back against the influence of the more conservative rabbis. And their argument is, among other things, that the practice is barbaric, that it's outdated and unenlightened, and that it's actually something of an embarrassment for Judaism, which most people see as a rather peaceful and progressive and self-critical religion outside of its fundamentalist corners. So here's a quote from uh, the rabbi Abraham Geiger from around 1845, just to give a sense of this debate. I must confess that I cannot comprehend the necessity of working up a spirit of enthusiasm for the ceremony merely on the ground that it is held in general esteem. It remains a barbarous, bloody act. The sacrificial idea which invested the act with sanctity in former days has no significance for us today. However tenaciously religious sentiment may have clung to it formerly, at present its only supporters are habit and fear, to which we certainly do not wish to erect any shrines. So this is a debate that's been happening within Judaism for several centuries, and this complicates the idea that you sometimes hear that circumcision is, in a way, mandatory or somehow non-negotiable for Jews because of the story about Abraham and the covenant of circumcision that's described in the book of Genesis. Many Jews, of course, do read the Torah this way, but many others read it differently, or they read it as having a symbolic significance that doesn't have to be literally enacted on their son's genitals. Uh, Moshe Rothenberg, who's an observant Jew, has made this point uh, by saying, I think I lost the quote here, so I'll just, uh, there it is. We have a higher level of awareness than people in the Bible. I don't believe in blood sacrifice. I fell in love with my son the first seven days. There was no way we were going to hurt him. Uh, so if there's one thing about Judaism that is non-negotiable in this discussion, it's the fact that it is not a monolithic faith where everybody does and believes the same things. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about geography and history. Uh, the additional things I want to set up have to do with recent events, which I'll highlight because they'll help me lay down some of my arguments later. So what's been happening recently, a few weeks ago you might have heard um, that 39 South African teenagers had died in the space of a month from complications ensuing from their tribal circumcisions. And these circumcisions are performed outside, on a mountain, they involve the use of spearheads and razors, household knives and other unsterilized equipment, and the cir circumcisers are obviously not medically trained. Uh, when a health minister from the province was asked what could be done to prevent these deaths, she replied that it wasn't her place as a woman to comment on this man's rite of passage. And she said, this is a tradition. This is a tradition. I want to highlight this idea about tradition because what it shows is that if something has gone on for a long enough time, if it's taken on for enough people, enough cultural meaning, then the concerns that you would normally expect to see about the harms involved, even when those harms are very significant and up to the point of death, can be either minimized or rationalized or otherwise disregarded. So as an example, the South African political commentator Justice Malala wrote last week, 
Nearly 40 innocent young black males have died under terrible circumstances. They died of excessive bleeding from their penises. Many were dehydrated, yet I am told that demanding action is un-African and a betrayal of my blackness. So you can see the concerns about identity and solidarity and uh, group membership are wrapped up with concerns about tradition as well. And these can also sometimes trump considerations about basic harm. Another South African columnist uh, put it this way. Because this is a matter of culture, people prefer to tread lightly, tempering their criticisms with politically correct noises about tolerance and respect. But isn't this in itself condescending and perhaps even racist? Appeals to culture, tradition, and the like have causality entirely back to front. Things could become cultural norms because they are good norms, but the fact that something is a cultural norm has no bearing on whether it's a good or a respectable norm or not. Uh, meanwhile, in New York City, I'm sorry this is so depressing, I just realized this is like a very negative speech. Uh, in New York City there was uh, some, some other news to consider. The, the candidates uh, for the New York City mayor's office were being asked about the position on an ultra-orthodox Jewish form of circumcision called Mazitz Bapet. And I'll just say that a lot of moderate and mainstream Jews were not aware that this form of circumcision existed until they read about it in the newspapers. So in this form of circumcision, the circumciser puts his mouth around the baby's penis to suck away the blood from the circumcision wound in order to adhere to instructions laid down in the Babylonian Talmud. And despite the obvious atavism of this practice, and despite its extremely unhygienic consequences, it's actually very common among today's Hasidic population in New York. The city health department estimates that more than 20,000 infants have undergone this procedure in just the past decade. During this period, it's been definitively linked to at least 13 cases of transmission of the herpes simplex virus type 1, and two babies uh, that, that are known about have gone on to die from their infections. Uh, and these numbers are likely to be underestimations. The Jewish Daily Forward reports that as many as 15 infections may occur each year for a total of 150 infections over the course of the decade but suggests that local hospitals sometimes fail to report these cases due to pressure from their Hasidic clients. Um, responding to these controversies, the current mayor of New York, Michael Bloomberg, insisted that a consent form be given to Orthodox Jewish parents before any oral genital contact could take place in order to alert them to the risk that their child might become infected with herpes, which is carried by something like 90% of the population. So if you're familiar with Michael Blum uh, Bloomberg, you know that he was in the news about a year ago for suggesting that oversized soft drinks should be banned in New York City because soft drinks have too much sugar and sugar leads to obesity and obesity is bad for your health. So I just want to point out that he wasn't actually suggesting any sort of ban or prohibition on this practice. He just said that there should be a consent form so that the parents would understand what they were signing up for or actually what they were signing their children up for as a lot of parents had said that they didn't actually know that oral genital contact would be a part of the ceremony. Uh, for suggesting this, he was met with a lawsuit from several Orthodox Jewish organizations who stated that the consent form would violate their freedom of religion. In addition, some influential New York rabbis have urged their followers to engage in civil disobedience by rejecting the forms and carrying on with the practices before, and the Brooklyn rabbi A. Romy Cohn explained it this way, the mayor is the mayor of the city of New York, but we have a mayor, he's the mayor of the universe, we're going to follow his instructions. Uh, finally, weighing in on the consent forms last week, the mayoral candidate John Liu, who is hoping to replace Michael Bloomberg, announced his opposition to the policy by saying, for thousands of years, this has been a practice that has been observed by people. As with most procedures, some risk is inherent, but I would certainly to defer to the rabbis on this, as opposed to thinking that, well, we know better after thousands of years of this practice. Um, we obviously know a lot of things better after thousands of years of any practice, including information about the way the viruses are transmitted and how they impact upon the health and safety of infants. So Mr. Liu's position seems to be in line with the one taken by the official from South Africa that I quoted earlier, and that is essentially, uh, this is a tradition. So we'll need to think about what the actual moral significance is of something being a tradition, and that's something I'll come back to in a little bit. Okay, that's all the setting up I wanted to do. And I know it's been a very long preamble, but I wanted to make sure that we have enough of a shared framework to get into these arguments. Here's the premise I said I would use. <clears throat> it should be considered morally impermissible to remove healthy, functional, erogenous tissue from another person's body without act, uh, first asking for and then actually receiving that person's informed permission. Now the first thing I need to do is to give a sort of defense for this premise, uh, which means I need to explain or justify why I think it should be a good rule for medical ethics. And to do that, I want to step back and consider where a principle like this could be coming from. Uh, some of you know the work of Richard Schwader from the University of Chicago, and he's given a really interesting account about different foundations for morality, which he thinks can be split up in these three different ways. 
Uh, so he talks about the ethics of autonomy, which focuses on things like individual rights and freedoms, and that's obviously the, the, the basis for the premise that I uh, introduced. And I'll come back to this in a second. But he also points out that there are other ways of thinking about morality as well. The second one is what he calls the ethics of community, which focuses on notions like respect and duty and society and interdependence and hierarchy. And the third is the ethics of divinity, which has to do with things like tradition and sanctity and purity and protecting the soul from moral contamination. And you can sort of see how circumcision is in tension with the first principle, but it might fit in with the last two types of morality. Now, Richard Schrader is an anthropologist, so his point in dividing things up this way is to show that uh, different cultures do emphasize different aspects of morality. And one of the important things that follows from this is that in Western societies, we have a tendency to see things only through the lens of autonomy, which means that we can miss out on the logic of what's going on in other cultures that are operating from the standpoints of community or divinity. And I think that these are very important considerations. But one thing that's missing from this picture is that it doesn't give us any way to actually evaluate these different moral systems and to come to a conclusion about which ones we should emphasize in a given type of society. And I'd be willing to consider that there are probably some societies or some periods of history where the ethics of community would be in some ways preferable to the ethics of autonomy, where the idea of the individual as the fundamental unit of moral analysis might not make the most sense, all things considered. And the same thing might be true of the ethics of divinity. And we could think about what kind of conditions would have to be in place to make this a, a kind of analysis work. But I also think that there are some very special features of the ethics of autonomy that uh, make it particularly well suited to the multicultural, secular, industrialized, constitutional democracies like the ones that make up what people call the West. In these societies, uh, people have access to information. They can be educated, they can travel and learn about different groups and cultures and religions. They can get on the internet and read about different points of view. And because of all this interaction and exchange, an individual's well-being is no longer determined by the norms and beliefs and practices of the particular community into which he happens to have been born. So let me apply this directly to circumcision. If I lived in a completely closed society and I had no access to other points of view and everyone in my village was missing the same part of their genitals, then as long as I can stipulate a few other conditions, like there are no risks involved, the complication rate is zero, effective anesthesia is always used, and nobody ever dies from this procedure, then it's at least conceivable to me that the tradition could be justified on the grounds that it would be very difficult to construe a lack of a foreskin as being a form of harm. But the problem is that societies don't actually work this way, and Western societies in particular work in the opposite way. In these societies, all it takes is about five minutes on the internet, or watching a YouTube video, or meeting someone from a non-circumcising culture to realize that something happened to you when you were an infant. And uh, this realization can have some pretty profound consequences for some men, and even men who didn't have anything in particular go wrong with their circumcision in the sense of experiencing one of those more drastic complications I talked about earlier. So here are the results from uh, one survey on this topic from the British Journal of Urology in 1999, uh, this is a self-selecting sample of circumcised men. They reported emotional distress, manifesting as intrusive thoughts about their circumcision, including feelings of mutilation, low self-esteem, inferiority to intact men, genital dysmorphia, rage, resentment or depression, violation, parental betrayal. Respondents reported that their physical and emotional suffering impeded emotional intimacy with partners, resulting in sexual dysfunction and a lack of compassion uh, from parents, siblings, or friends fostered bitter, interpersonal, uh, uh, and conflict or alienation. Men who felt harmed by their circumcisions felt they had no acceptable outlet for serious feelings about circumcision, and most had not sought help for their suffering. The reasons given included thinking no recourse was available, embarrassment, and fear of ritual. A 2012 global survey of circumcision harm included some more specific responses like these. Uh, sadness. Curious to know what it would have been like to have not been circumcised. Problems with intimacy. Embarrassed about the size and dryness of my penis and how long it takes to achieve orgasm. I should have had the opportunity to make this decision for myself. Outraged that I was not given a choice. I was just fucking fine the way I was born. <coughs> Uh, just to give one more example, one of my Jewish friends sent me an email while I was pre preparing this talk, and he said, um, guess how offensive I find it when people tell me that I have no right to be pissed off that my penis was mutilated due to a combination of junk science and a religious doctrine which I find repugnant. So, um, what is the point of these examples? 
For people who say that an infant won't consciously remember the trauma of being circumcised, that much is probably true. We do have reason to think that unconscious trauma is happening and that longer term changes in brain functioning uh, are happening as well, but there is a lot more research that has to be done to understand the extent of the changes involved. And of course, a lot of infants grow up to become men who don't particularly care that they were circumcised or that happen to like their penises without a foreskin for whatever reason. And I have no doubt about those two points and the existence of these populations. Uh, and they may even be the majority of cases. But there is a third consideration, and that's the existence of a large number of men who don't remember the actual surgery because they were just a few days old at the time, but who now look down at their genitals and compare what they see to the information that's available to them on the internet. And they feel, as my friend feels who sent me the email, and as a lot of the men that I've talked with about this feel, that they've been sexually abused. Now, all of this is just underlined the point about autonomy, which is uh, the principle that I think makes the most sense for societies in which people do have access to information. These are societies where people don't always remain in the same sheltered communities that they were brought up in, whether that's a religious community like in Islam or Judaism, or even a much larger community like the United States. So just to illustrate, I was born in the United States, and I grew up in a culture that practices infant circumcision. But now I live in Europe, where being circumcised is more of a liability. So the scales are tipped in the other way. By the same token, my friend who sent me that email grew up in a religious family, but now he doesn't believe in God. And in fact, more than 50% of American Jews are atheists. Uh, so the problem is that he's already had the most private and intimate part of his body, something that's profoundly central to his sense of identity and sexuality, his ability to relate to others sexually, permanently engraved with the sign of his parents' religious commitment. And this is something that he has to think about and process and grapple with literally every time he goes to the toilet. So those are my arguments for why circumcision should be left to an age of consent. What I want to do now is consider a couple of counter-arguments that are sometimes raised, and then I'll tie things up with a discussion about some of the similarities and differences between male and female forms of genital cutting. Now, the first objection I hear when I tell people what I think about circumcision is the sort of comparison they make between circumcision for infant boys and ear piercing for little girls. Uh, and I think what they want to argue is that parents are seen as having a right, or at least a prerogative, to pierce their daughter's ears before she can possibly consent to this, and so why shouldn't they be able to circumcise their sons in the same way for whatever reason is important to the parents? Now, I didn't actually mention this objection in the abstract because I wasn't going to talk about it, but um, I saw this exact same argument in the Journal of Medical Ethics in 2004 in an article by the philosopher Soren Holm. So this objection is apparently taken seriously by at least one actual philosopher, and so I've uh, added a little response on this point. There are two basic ways to respond to the ear piercing example. Uh, the first way is to point out that parents probably should wait a few years before piercing their daughter's ears. That way, a child can have a chance to say whether that's something she'd like to go through or not. Um, they're her ears. Ear piercing is painful. She might get an infection. And if all that's being done so that her parents can have something nice to look at, then it seems to me that she's being instrumentalized in a potentially problematic way. At least it isn't an unreasonable way of thinking about things. But the second, and I think stronger way uh, to respond to this comparison is just to point out that the two practices are not remotely comparable, either in terms of the intervention themselves or their long-term effects. So ear piercing does not remove any tissue. It does not threaten any bodily function. It can be tolerated without anesthesia. It is never a source of resentment for the child who grows up. And it is ultimately reversible in any case since the hole will close up over time if that's what the child decides. On the other hand, uh, male circumcision is not reversible, is frequently a source of resentment and anger and feelings of sexual violation. It removes a large amount of primary erogenous tissue, it destroys the mechanical functions of the foreskin, and it would not be tolerated without anesthesia if the patient were an adult. Okay, uh, the next big argument that people make about circumcision is that it might confer health benefits, like reducing a person's chances of getting urinary tract infections, or penile cancer, or even HIV, as I'll discuss in a second. And so this might be a reason to remove the foreskin in infancy. Uh, the first thing to say about health benefits is that it's not clear that they actually exist, uh, at least in the aggregate. So in 2012, the American Academy of Pediatrics released reports saying that the benefits outweigh the risks. Uh, and then a couple of months <coughs> later, a group of European doctors wrote an article saying that the risks substantially outweigh the benefits. And um, just to talk for a second about these risks, I'm going to go to my page about risks. So I've been kind of talking about these abstractly. So uh, last week in Chicago, it was reported that an American boy had lost about 40% of the head of his penis to what the defense attorney for the doctor described as one of those unfortunate complications of routine circumcision. 
unfortunate complications of westernized, hospitalized, best case scenario circumcision include hemorrhage, sepsis, gangrene, necrosis, metal stenosis, urinary obstruction, urinary retention, rupture of the bladder, skin bridges, fistula, cysts, penile denudation, painful erections, laceration of the scrotum, injury to the glands, partial amputation of the penis, complete amputation of the penis, myocardial injury due to surgical trauma, impotence, nerve damage, and death. The least frequent of these is death, um, but because of the sheer volume of circumcisions performed in the United States, it's been estimated that at least 117 American babies die each year from circumcision-related causes. And this is in the best case hospital scenario. But the most common complication that I mentioned before is metal stenosis, which happens in 5 to 20% of cases and normally requires a corrective surgery. Uh, finally, we don't actually know all the complications because a lot of them show up many years after the surgery. So if you remove too much skin for an erection, you won't know that until the child grows up. If there are erectile function problems later or problems with reduced sensitivity, these things won't become apparent until later and they won't be recorded any anywhere as a complication. Uh, another thing to consider is that the risks, uh, talking about risks ignores the fact that the acceptable risk for a social surgery performed on a healthy child who hasn't consented should be zero. Uh, and when a risk or a complication does happen, it happens to the person's genitals and it can potentially impact upon the rest of that person's life. Uh, what else do I want to say? Um, that's about it for risks. So the European doctors uh, were a little bit incensed by the AAP policy report, and they wrote, only one of the arguments put forward by the American Academy of Pediatrics has some theoretical relevance in relation to infant male circumcision, namely the possible protection against urinary tract infections in infant boys, which can be easily treated with antibiotics without tissue loss. The other claimed health benefits, including protection against HIV AIDS, genital herpes, genital warts, and penile cancer are questionable, weak, and likely to have little public health relevance in a Western context, and they do not represent compelling reasons for surgery before boys are old enough to decide for themselves. So uh, the point about this disagreement between the Americans and the Europeans is that if any health benefits do exist for circumcision, the only people who find these particularly impressive are the ones who already come from the circumcising culture. So both groups of doctors have access to the same literature, both can evaluate the same data, and yet they draw opposite conclusions about what those data show in terms of health benefits. The second point about this disagreement is that almost none of the health benefits, even if they were convincing, actually apply to infants. So my arguments about delaying circumcision until an age of consent are still very much valid. The exception to this is uh, the case of urinary tract infections, which children do sometimes get before puberty. But this example is not helpful for the person who wants to defend infant circumcision for a couple of reasons. First, urinary tract infections are extremely rare for boys, and this is a general thing to look out for when people are talking about supposed health benefits. If the disease is something like penile cancer, which is almost non-existent, it's so rare, and only happens in uh, very older men, or even if you're talking about HIV in a Western context, you have to remember that the base rates for these issues are very, very low. So with UTIs, for example, these happen about 1% of the time for boys. And you'd have to perform 111 circumcisions on the most conservative estimate to prevent one single case of UTI. And what you should do is just prescribe oral antibiotics if an infection does occur uh, in the rare case that, that, it, that it comes about. And that's, of course, exactly the same thing that we do for girls. Nobody recommends any sort of preventive surgery for girls who get uh, UTIs about 10 times more frequently. Okay, that's all I want to say about health benefits. Um, it's not clear that they exist. They don't apply to infants. The risks are statistically guaranteed to happen, and when they do happen, um, they can be quite significant because they're on the genitals. And I will just say that if I were giving this talk in the US, I'd make this section longer, but I don't think the um, European audience I have is quite so taken in by the, the argument of health benefits. Okay. Um, Nearing the end here. The next objection is one that says that circumcision can prevent the spread of HIV in Africa. So maybe this can override the principle of autonomy I was arguing for earlier. Now this is obviously a health benefits argument as well, but I wanted to give it its own section because it's the one you hear most often about. And I think it also has an emotional effect on people because uh, HIV and AIDS is as devastating as it is and is as hard to control it is, as it is. And so it seems like anything that could help with this problem would be worth looking into. So I'll make a few brief points about this. Um, first, the circumcision trials in Africa were carried out on adult volunteers, so they don't actually pose a challenge to my principle about autonomy and consent. And in fact, there is no evidence that infant circumcision is protected against HIV. What this means is that if an adult decides to have his foreskin removed as a form of partial prophylaxis, I certainly don't have any moral objections to his doing this. 
so long as the risks and benefits are clearly explained and there's no coercion involved. Now, I don't think that this would be a rational decision, since he would have to wear a condom either way. And I would be worried about what's called risk compensation, where he might have sex without a condom because he thinks that he's now been protected. But ethically, at least, this kind of circumcision seems okay. On the other hand, I do object to arguments to try to turn adult voluntary circumcision in sub-Saharan Africa into infant involuntary circumcision in the United States, which at least a handful of researchers are starting to suggest. And this is because, first, the epidemiological environments are just flatly non-analogous, specifically in the way that HIV is actually transmitted and spread. And second, infants are not at risk of getting sexually transmitted HIV unless they're molested. Okay. This is the last objection, and it's the one that says that infant circumcision is a religious custom, so if the parents want to circumcise their child for religious reasons, this could be a way of justifying the violation of the child's bodily integrity. Now, this is obviously a huge topic, and there's a huge literature on this. So there's no way I'm going to settle this question in, in a few minutes, but I will make a couple of general points. Uh, the first point has to do with Muslim circumcision. And as I talked about earlier, there is really no mention of circumcision in the Quran, although it is discussed in the Hadith, which is a collection of sayings and exhortations that have been attributed to Muhammad. And the main result of this is that there's a lot of disagreement and arguing about whether male circumcision is required or not required or recommended or highly recommended. And the answer varies depending upon the specific branch or school of Islam or which scholar you talk to or what the local custom is. So uh, the same thing I said about Judaism, I'll say about Islam, which is that it's not a monolith and different Muslims interpret the Quran and the Hadith in different ways. Uh, one school in particular opposes circumcision known as the Quranists because they see the Hadith as non-authoritative and because they can point to passages in the Quran that talk about the perfection of creation and God-given um, bodily creation. Now, Muslims who do circumcise do this when their sons are between five and eight years old in the typical case, uh, which is illustrated by this picture. Uh, although you do see infant circumcision in some instances as well carried out in the hospital. Um, in terms of the arguments I've been making, I think it would be preferable if circumcision could be shifted more toward the teenage years or later, and if it was framed as a conscious decision by a competent person to demonstrate his allegiance to Islam or follow the ways of Muhammad or whatever the value of the gesture would be for that person. On the other hand, I don't think that boys who are five or eight years old are really consenting to circumcision, and this is a view shared by a number of moderate Muslims, uh, one of whom is Dr. Arif Muhammad Bimji, who has written, parents do not have a right to sur uh, surgically alter their children when there is no opportunity for the child to participate in the decision making, and the decision can be reasonably delayed. Okay, uh, and what about Jewish circumcision? As I talked about before, different Jews believe different things and hold different interpretations of the Torah. So uh, the first point is to just be on guard about anyone who claims to be speaking on behalf of all their fellow Jews. Some Jews are opposed to circumcision, some very passionately so. Some think it's a requirement, some are less certain one way or the other, and end up circumcising as a cultural default. Um, there is a difference with Islam that circumcision is at least mentioned in the book of Genesis, and since the eighth day in particular is given as the time frame, some Jews, especially Jews who are more conservative, believe that it would violate the terms of the covenant to delay circumcision beyond that point. So my arguments about consent are obviously not going to matter to anyone who holds this particular view, and this does pose a problem for the suggestion I've been making. I want to take a second to illustrate this point, um, because I think it shows where the fault line is in this type of discussion. And this quote comes from a conversation between the Jewish filmmaker Eliyahu Ungar Sargon and an Orthodox rabbi named Hershey Warsh. So the rabbi is talking about circumcision, and he says, it's painful, it's abusive, it's traumatic. And if anybody who's not in a covenant does it, I think they should be put in prison. I don't think anybody has an excuse for mutilating a child, depriving them of part of their penis. We don't have rights to other people's bodies, and a baby needs to have its rights protected. I think anybody who circumcises a baby is an abuser, unless it's absolutely medically advised. Otherwise, what for? There's a pause in the interview, and then Eliyahu says, how does this covenant alleviate your ethical responsibility that you just so articulately pose? How is it that being in this covenant exempts you from that term? How can you not call yourself an abuser? And uh, the rabbi actually uh, interrupts Eli at this point and says, I'm an abuser. I do abusive things because I'm in covenant with God. And ultimately, God owns my morals. He owns my body. He owns my past and future. And that's the meaning of this covenant that I agree to ignore the pain and the rights and the trauma of my child to be in this covenant. 
So I think that's the fault line for this conversation. And I think it's where we have to start thinking about what kind of response to give to someone who not only conceives of circumcision as a mutilation of the penis, and who agrees that it's a violation of a child's rights, but who insists that it must be done anyway because of an agreement that he's made with God. Now, I don't know what the solution is to this problem. I do think that what the rabbi is doing is unethical, or at least that's what I've been trying to argue. But I also think that the rabbi thinks what he's doing is unethical as well. And it's just that ethics and mere morality are not as important to the rabbi as following what he sees are God's commandments. I'm also not convinced that banning circumcision would be the right answer, because the rabbi would do it anyway, and circumcision would go underground. So the only real hope for reform, I think, is going to be to address the root of this problem and other problems like it, which is the persistence of religious fundamentalism in modern societies. Now, um, I said that I was going to conclude with a discussion about male versus female forms of genital cutting, and I am going to end on this topic, but I'd like to do it in the form of a story. So this is a story that comes from my hometown of Seattle. Um, about 15 years ago, a group of Somali immigrants took their daughters to Harborview Medical Center and asked if they could be circumcised in order to fulfill a perceived cultural obligation. And the doctors there suggested that what they could do is what's called a ritual nick, which is that they would take a razor blade and make a very small incision into the clitoral hood, which, as I mentioned before, is the same tissue as the foreskin. Now, unlike in male circumcision, in this procedure, they weren't going to actually remove any tissue. So no function would be destroyed, no sensation would be diminished, the clitoris was not going to become exposed or irritated or dried out, and all this was going to happen under anesthesia so that the girls wouldn't feel any pain. Now, their idea in proposing this was to keep the parents from taking their daughters back to Somalia to be circumcised in a more invasive way. And I think that they really did think that they were uh, protecting the girls from a more serious harm by offering what was called the Seattle Compromise, uh, this ritual name. But as you can probably imagine, the anti-FGM, or female genital mutilation movement, particularly in the, in the US, responded to this proposal by saying that no cutting of any kind, to any degree, for any reason, should happen to any part of any girl's genitals under any circumstances. So Seattle Compromise was very quickly abandoned. And I don't actually know what happened to the Somali families after that. But I want to draw a contrast here between the universal outrage that was expressed about the mere idea of a pinprick on a girl's clitoral hood, which I agree should not be done, and the deafening silence that we hear about the total removal of boys' foreskins happening on a daily basis and millions of times each year. And I think it's time we started to think about extending to newborn boys at least a fraction of the ethical and legal protections that we extend to girls. Thank you.